Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Cancer Now What Vodcast. I am your host, Jenny Martin, and I am very pleased to be joined in studio today by Dr. Jay Patel of Pain and Palliative Associates and Dr. Arun Singhavi of Arizona Center for Cancer Care and Virginia G. Piper Cancer Care Network. Hi, Dr. Singhavi and Dr. Patel. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Of course. So I wanted to have you on the show today because there's a lot of misconceptions around what is known as palliative care and palliative medicine, uh, specifically when it pertains to cancer patients. And Dr. Singhavi, we've had you on the show before, medical oncologist. You get questions about palliative care, I'm sure, all the time in your mm -hmm. practice. Um, Dr. Patel, I wanted to uh, bring you because as a fellowship trained palliative medicine and pain specialist, um, you can really clear up a lot of these misconceptions for people. So I guess I'll start by asking, how do you explain palliative care to someone who doesn't know much about it? Yeah. So first of all, thanks for having me, Jenny. And I, I think that's a good question to start with. And you'll be surprised at how many times I get asked this question and not only by uh, the family of the patient and the patient themselves, but also by healthcare professional. And one of the reasons is that, as you said, that there are so many misconceptions around this area. Uh, what is palliative care, what they can do and what they cannot do. So I think that's a good question to start with. And, and before we get into this thing, uh, I would like to you to know that it's very important for us to know that what the patient who are dealing with the cancer they go through and what the illness brings to them and their loved one so when patients who are dealing with the cancer and their family, when they are going through this whole journey, it's more than the physical aspect of the illness they are dealing with. It's the spiritual aspect, the emotional aspect, the psychosocial aspect that they're dealing with. And in the medicine, we have been trained to so much focus on the physical aspect of the illness that many times we forget that the, it's a whole total care. And the word which I like to do is the holistic care. And that's the gist of palliative care is that when we in palliative care, when we practice, we understand that these patients who are dealing with the cancer, they have more than the physical aspect of the illness. They have a lot of psychosocial symptoms. They are going through a lot of spiritual distress in their life. So to understand palliative care, it's a holistic care for the patients who are dealing with the cancer and not only for the patient, for their loved one as well, who help them to go through this journey in a more total care approach. I love that. That's, yeah. a, that's a great way of explaining it. Thank you so much. Dr. Singhavi, um, how do you view as a medical oncologist the role of palliative care? I think it's huge. I, I think, you know, one of the things I bring up for patients is in cancer, particularly when we think about metastatic cancers or cancers where we are, we treat with palliative intent, um, meaning that my goal for treating these patients is quality of life and quantity of life and in that order and that quality of life piece is huge because you need support as dr patel brought up yes there's a physical aspect of suffering that our patients are going through but there's so many other um, aspects like the psychosocial aspect the mental anguish of dealing with cancer the relationships changing and all of those so i think it's a huge part of our care um, and partnering with palliative care is so important um, hopefully early on in the journey so our patients have access to the resources that um, we'll talk about in a little bit as well, I assume. Definitely, for sure. Dr. Patel, so how do you specifically find palliative care fits into the journey of a cancer patient? How can it help them? Yeah, so as we discussed that when the patients and the loved ones are going through that journey, they go through so much um, Let's talk about that. The first is the physical aspect. So as Dr. Sengave will agree that when they go through the cancer and the treatment itself, uh, they can have so many symptoms and, 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 and physical uh, debility that affect their quality of life. Unbearable pain, nausea and vomiting, uh, insomnia, they're not able to sleep. Uh, they have issues like low appetite, they are losing weight, they are losing hair. And all these things also lead to psychosocial symptoms, things like anxiety and depression. Now, even for the healthy people who don't have cancer, think about if you're not feeling well, you don't feel like doing anything else. So along with this patients feeling so many symptoms, we are having them go through the chemotherapy, going for doctor's appointment. So 
it's a whole lot of what they are going through. So one of the main aspects of palliative care is to help them with those symptoms, is help them with the pain, help them with the nausea, vomiting, help them with the things like appetite, uh, help them with uh, having them on the right regimen for the medication for anxiety and depression and things like sleep. So the minor, minor thing which go unnoticed in, in routine care, palliative care focus on that, that physical aspect of the symptom. The second thing is bringing them resources. As we talk about that, they can have a lot of aspect of, of their illness, psychosocial, spiritual aspect of their illness, uh, which is causing distress for them and their loved one. So what palliative care service does is bringing them resources. It may be chaplain visit, it may be psychologist, it may be just having more of a volunteer service for uh, them to be available. Uh, so that aspect of care, uh, which palliative care bring. And third, which is one of the most important, is being their partner on this journey to help them to navigate through the cancer and the treatment and on each stage to discuss what's happening, what is the situation, what is the prognosis, but what the future looks like, what is the prognosis. And in each stage, putting patient and their loved one at the center and asking them that how they want to navigate the further care, what we call in is, is discussing about goals of care, that how they want to go to the next step and what they want to do with the next step is something which is also a very important aspect of palliative care as well. Definitely. So goals of care um, doesn't necessarily translate to end of life, right? Absolutely not. And I'm sure both you and Dr. Singhavi um, get <laughs> some weird looks when you mention palliative care to patients. Dr. Singhavi, can you talk us through that a little bit? I think it, usually when we introduce the idea of palliative care, um, Many patients, and as Dr. Patel pointed out, actually, healthcare providers also will say, oh, so we're going to transition to comfort care or we're going to withdraw care, a term I hate. Um, it's not. Palliative care is looking at, hey, you've got all of this stuff going on. How can we do more to help you go through this? Like, there's a lot of resources here. This is not end of life. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying you're going through a lot of stuff. We need to help you with more than just how are we doing the treatment? What do we need to do to get to chemo appointments? Here's the medications for nausea. Here's the medications for you know, insomnia, things like that. We also need to support you in other ways. And there's this entire team of doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals that can provide those resources and help you through that at home. And while you're like, it's a, it's a huge thing. And I think Introducing it in that manner is important, but also separating out that, yes, they also wear this other hat for hospice. If and when we need to, we'll talk about that, and you've already got a partner there who can help us with that transition, again, if and when we need to. And that's, a, that's also, I think, the if in that is, is the key piece, right? Yeah. When you're communicating with patients, it's the if. Do you... Do you suggest with a cancer patient bringing in um, palliative care right from the beginning of diagnosis, Dr. Patel? Absolutely. So Jenny, I have patients in all the spectrum. Sometimes I get to see the patients who are in stage one of their cancer. They are even pending biopsy and pending diagnosis of their cancer. And sometimes I see the patients who are in very advanced stage of the cancer. The priority of the care and the discussion is much different. And Bringing palliative care early is very important. One of the examples which I give to a lot of my colleagues and my patients is think about this thing. I'll give you an example. Let's say you are going on a road trip in the mountains. And if I tell you, hey, Jenny, you're going on a road trip. What's your plan? You cannot answer me this question because you don't know what the weather is like, what the road is condition is going to be like. So you say, let me see what is the road's condition, what the weather is going to snow or not. Because depending on that, your plan will change that if that's snowy, the road is very, you know, mountain roads, then rather I would not keep driving. I would, you know, do a night stay. It's exactly the same thing. When patients go through the cancer treatment, it's a lot of unpredictable things. There is a lot of unknown things. And we as a palliative care providers help them to navigate through that journey. So bringing palliative care early is very important in this case. That's amazing. I love that analogy. Thank you for breaking it down that way. Absolutely. Do you think that... Um, when you start early on a journey with a patient, you're able to prevent some of the um, symptoms that might be difficult for them to navigate or get in front of them a little bit rather than trying to catch up on pain? Absolutely. Uh, 
first of all when we have longer build repo there is more trust into that but a lot of time as much as all our critical care and medical oncologists they are so competent but when they see a patient the focus is so much different so because their focus is how i can beat this cancer what is the next step what is the chemotherapy is it affecting or not so a lot of things get unseen during that care so if there is extra set of eyes and ears talking to the patients during this whole course uh, we can do so much good to the patients and i see patients in the late stage and when we talk to the patients and we talk about the symptoms and what they are going through i can definitely see that how things could have been much different if somebody else would have talked to them 6 months ahead of the time yeah that just makes sense to me dr singhavi what are your thoughts on that i think the the other part just adding to that is seeing somebody in their home environment i it's a different thing than seeing you in the clinic right to get to the clinic my patient had to do a lot they they you know got dressed they look good because they're coming out in the public and that's different from seeing them in the home environment what are their struggles doing that i think it's a huge advantage that our palliative care colleagues have and as that journey is brought in earlier and earlier as you pointed out palliative care colleagues can serve as advocates um i spoke to uh, uh one of my patients is palliative care nurses earlier today and she was saying hey uh mr so and so he's having this at home we're delivering food we're doing this I said okay that's actually really helpful for me to know so we can provide resources and we can talk about what is truly going on for at home so it's as as you said it's another set of eyes it's another advocate on the patient side to help us all as a team work on that quality of life piece of everything we're doing and that that second set of eyes is another physician which i think yes. is huge right because you all went to the same type of training the same type of medical schooling so you have the same vocabulary in talking through what these patients are going through th- through the whole journey right and i and i think that that's really important too and an ex- that, you know i frequently rely on them to help me with pain management and like for symptom management it's it's your expertise <laughs> you know i i i I take care of cancer patients. I can manage symptoms uh for quite a bit. But then when I have symptoms I can't control, mm-hmm. I always look to palliative care and say, "Can you help me with this and what do you think we should do?" Mm-hmm. Um and like as I said, it's a team effort for our patient. You mentioned Dr. Singhavi that we are um treating palliative care in the home. Is that uh Dr. Patel the only place where we're treating palliative care? Um is it typically in the home do people come to your office is it in the hospital like where does that service occur yeah it's changing uh, you know jenny is changing quite a bit in in recent years um right now it can be anywhere um we see a lot of patients in the hospital setup but also there are a lot of community resources uh, so a lot of patients they have palliative care services at home as well uh, there are also very emerging palliative care clinics as well who see the patients on an outpatient basis as well so it can be anywhere um, but i think i do agree with dr singhavi that primary role of palliative care should be in the home because when you are talking about such a delicate topic about their illness their symptoms i think they are much more comfortable sitting in their own living room and talking about their illness and how liable they feel in their illness so primary role should be at home but it can be provided anywhere okay great so If there are physicians that are treating oncology patients who are asked by their patient because they saw this, can I get some palliative care, right? Um would that physician then call in the palliative medicine physician to go see them at their house or would they, you know, is it just depend on how well the patient is doing, how well they feel, is it is that kind of what it's dependent on? Yeah, so again, I think um going back to the point which I was telling you earlier that it's a uh, it's a holistic approach of the care so it takes the whole village uh and that's why uh in most of the palliative care team especially when you talk about the home team uh, there's more than physician aspect of that there is a chaplain service there is a psychosocial component there is a volunteer cns sometimes even psychologist therapist as well believe me or not but physical therapist mm. as well so it's a whole village who helps in this patient care So at home yes we have a lot of community resources and anytime when the physician like Dr Singhavi if he has patient in the clinic and if he wants that patient to be followed by palliative care services at home there are resources available in the clinic who can follow them across the board uh, in the hospital there is mostly a provider driven team so either physician or nurse practitioner who are working in the hospital 
and they see the patient in the hospital. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if a patient uh, is in need of these services, they can just tell their doctor, or their medical oncologist, who can find out where to get it for them, where the most appropriate place for them is to be served by palliative medicine, no matter what the specialty in, in that scope. Absolutely. Perfect. Okay. So the Medonc knows how to find you guys and your team. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Most of the time. <laughs> Most of the time. Yes. And if not, they can call Arizona Center for Cancer Care and we will make sure they find you. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> um, so um, let's talk about the different codes. Okay. I, I don't know um, all of them. I do know about the DNR. I do know about um, h- hospice. Like there's a DNI. What are these different codes and what do they mean to patients and their families? Yeah, I'm glad you asked this question uh, because uh, this is, again, one of the most misunderstood topic in the healthcare is the discussion about the core status and the level of care. It has nothing to do with this thing. Basically, when you discuss the core status, that means I'm asking an individual about their wish, about what they want us to do after they have died, plain and simple. And it's so important because when we think it's as important as asking somebody about their religion, what is their religion preference? Because we as a human being, we have right to decide how we want to live our life. We should also have right to decide how we want to die. And so code stretch discussion is basically asking the patient that once your heart is stopped beating on its own, once you stop breathing, what you want us to do. And the whole COVID experience has, if anything, has taught us the importance of discussing this topic. It has nothing to do with the patient's age. It has nothing to do with patient's stage of the illness. And it definitely has nothing to do with the hospice uh, discussion as well. It basically means that if you have this illness, whenever if you are dying of your illness, what you want us to do at that point. Now, that discussion is more important for the topic we are discussing here for cancer patient. Because, of course, if I have 20-year-old patient who have asthma, that discussion, I, I'm still going to ask the patient But that is not very valuable because I even as a healthcare professional, I want to make sure that this patient get everything possible to be revived back to the life because there is a high chance for me to revive this patient. But if I'm seeing Dr. Singhavi's patient who's dealing with stage 4 cancer and now patient is in the hospital with the infection in the ICU, and if this patient goes through cardiac cardiac arrest, that's not something which is unexpected. That is because patient's body has finally done fighting with their cancer. So at that point... I want to make sure that the patient really want us to try to bring him or her back to the life, knowing advanced illness, what patient has. Does it make sense? That does make sense. It does make sense. I mean, I, you know, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, I'm a healthy, you know, 46 year old woman, and I would want somebody to know what I would want to happen. And I'm not sick, right? Like I would want the people in my life to make sure to know what my wishes are because someday it's inevitable I will pass away, right? So um, I think that your point is so well taken because the the patients that you're working with in oncology specifically, um, I guarantee if they have, just like most people have even when they're healthy, a preference for what they want to happen to them. I mean, I can sit here and ask you guys and you can probably tell me exactly what you would want to happen if, you know, forbid you died, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that because it's such a taboo conversation that people struggle to have it. But um, what you're saying makes perfect sense to me. And I think it's so important that people are encouraged to have that conversation, especially when they're sick, especially with their physicians and other providers. Because if they don't, the doctors get to do whatever they want after you pass away. And why do they get to choose? Because it's not their life, right? Mm-hmm. So I am I really appreciate your point. And I, and I yeah. understand for yeah. sure. And I actually, I, please, the doctors don't get to do what they want. Oh, they're, really? They're required to There's kind a of protocol. assume. Okay. No, they're required to assume that you would want chest compressions. You would want oh, to be intubated. Really? You have no choice. You've essentially, by not declaring your a choice or having that discussion, oh, with the default is that they don't have a choice. My 90-year-old patient who came in unconscious will have to go through CPR. They'll have to go through intubation and the chest compression and the trauma that comes with that. Um, yeah. I mean, if somebody that age wakes up after going through all that, what's their quality of life at that point, right? I think that should be, statistically speaking, a person who has a, a, a cardiac event or an arrest where they should pass in the hospital and we you know, go through compressions and 
go through of that, go through with that, their chance of coming back to the same mental capacity they had before is less than 1%. Mm -hmm. What did we offer that patient? Again, in the grant, I, did we help or did we hurt? Yeah. I a, totally hear. And that should be up to the patient. Agreed. Not to the, the law or the physician. Yeah. So, but if people don't make the choice, then you don't have a choice. You bring them back. Wow, that's really interesting. I didn't know well, that. Just a little bit of correction, Jenny. Yeah, please. We don't bring them back. We try to bring them back. We try to bring them back. Because that's a major important point is yes. that, and, and all of us who have gone through medical training, Dr. Singhvi, myself, yes. we, we have done CPR on the patients where we know that we are not doing anything good to the patients. I'm, I'm trained in Brooklyn, and back in Brooklyn, when in a busy practice, I, didn't, I have performed CPR where as a resident, I knew as soon as I start CPR, I knew that I'm not going to bring this patient back. And I'm breaking their ribs. I'm hearing the sound of breaking the ribs and everything. And I'm shocking them, knowing that I'm not doing any good. And it, it hurts me spiritually and emotionally that I'm doing this thing to this patient or this, this person when they are going through their last phase mm. of life. That is so powerful. Wow. Thank think, you, guys. Yeah, I think patients also wow. understand. It's, you know, the, we, we say that we're doing, you know, if the way I ever tell my patients is, if your heart should stop or you should stop breathing, would you want me to do the protocol, which is chest compressions, intubation, and all of that, or would you want me to let you pass in peace? And I think thinking of it that way sometimes helps people say, yeah, I don't want to go through the, the trauma of that. It's, that would be traumatic. Very it, traumatic. Yes. Wow. That's so interesting. I never knew that you guys were told to try to bring people back no matter what if they didn't specify otherwise. By law. <laughs> That's insane. I'm sorry, not insane, so, just yeah. bl mind blowing. Wow. Well, that is quite the responsibility on uh, physicians. It really is. Let's shift gears back to um, quality of life, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's very important. But also, I want to really um, understand, and we touched on this a little bit, but I want to circle back to it. Dr. Singhavi, from an oncologist perspective, when is the best time and when are you typically introducing palliative medicine? What's the circumstance? What's the, the time you're doing that? So I'll bring up palliative care, uh, particularly for my patients that have metastatic cancers. I'll introduce that idea early on, usually within our first few visits to say, hey, we have support services when we need to. If we're getting more and more symptoms, if we need to, we can have additional support at home or resources available to us. Mm -hmm. As we get closer to, you know, if we're having trouble with treatments or if we're having a lot of symptoms, uh, I'll introduce that more strongly at that point and say, hey, I think we should introduce, go meet, have them come to you, meet them and see what you think. Mm -hmm. um, see if it makes sense or not. Um, I'm still here. I'm still your oncologist. I'm a phone call away or my chart message away, but I want some additional eyes and help for us at home or wherever you are. Okay. And how do they usually respond to that? It's extra help. They're happy yeah. with it. For they're the most part, in that context, they're usually very happy with getting extra help. And Dr. Patel, are you finding that when physicians explain it that way, um, patients are receptive to getting that extra help? Absolutely. And, and many times what I have realized, Jenny, is that more than the patient, it's the provider who are afraid of having palliative care involved. Is, and it's a it's, uh, combination of everything. It's a combination of them not feeling a sense of they are giving up as, you know, one of the misconceptions we talk about is, uh, but also them feeling that I want to do something extra for my patients, which can help. Uh, but many times what I have realized that when I go and talk to the patients, they are very receptive for the whole total care, which we can provide. And especially with the symptom management, that's that's amazing when we can help them with the smallest thing. And, and just to give you an example, one of the smallest thing which uh, which I, I wrote an article about, as Dr. Singhvi will know, is that when patients go through the cancer and the treatment, they don't taste their food because they have particular electrolytes, which is low. And so smaller thing which we can pay attention, energy, how is your energy level, what we need to do, uh, how, how are you able to taste your food, do we need to change anything, how much you are eating. So the smaller thing, as, as Dr. Singhvi was saying, is extra set of eyes and ears for them to hear. And I always get amazing response, me being involved in the case. I love that. Yeah. That's got to be so satisfying when you're with the patient and they just are so grateful to that level of relief, yeah. really, Absolutely. after what they're going through. Yeah. Well, I have learned a lot today. Thank you so much, Dr. Singhavi and Dr. Patel, for being with us today. I really appreciate the time. And I have um, 
two pretty significant takeaways from our conversation. One is that physicians and patients alike should not be concerned or worried or scared of the word palliative. It's there to support them. Um, and the second thing is that we have to have a plan for what happens to us after we pass away, because if we don't tell people what we want, we will likely not get what we want. Um, so thank you both for filling us in and those two very important uh, messages. And I'm really looking forward to how our audience will respond to this conversation. And I'm sure that they've also gotten a lot out of it as well. So thank you both. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you so much for being with us today. I hope you got as much out of this conversation as I did. I want to give a special thank you to Dr. Arun Singhavi and Dr. Jay Patel for being our guests in studio today. If you'd like more information on Dr. Singhavi and Arizona Center for Cancer Care, you can go to www.arizonaccc.com. If you'd like more information on Dr. Patel, you can call 480-626-6318. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.